Ready? I have your attention, please. The podcast, World Awakenings, the fast track to enlightenment, is now on the air. May I have your attention, please? The podcast, World Awakenings, is now on the air. This is World Awakenings, the fast track to enlightenment with your host, Carl Gruber. World Awakenings is a podcast dedicated to opening your mind, your heart, and your eyes to the fact that the world's population is now, more than ever, awakening to all things metaphysical and spiritual, and just how they play an all-important role in our daily life. So join Carl on this enlightening experience as he interviews metaphysical and spiritual experts to discuss, debate, and delve deeply into the hows and whys of this worldwide awakening. We welcome you to the World Awakenings Podcast. Before we start, we'd like to tell you about a special ebook written by the show's host, Carl Gruber. The Three Pillars, a simple three step process to manifest positive and permanent change in your life. The concise 32 page Three Pillars ebook will teach you how to become a successful and consistent co creator of your life path with the Law of Attraction. Yes, you can manifest the life you truly desire, and the ebook is absolutely free. Simply go to Carl's website, carlgruberlifecoach.com. That's K A R L G R U B E R lifecoach.com. Click on the header title About Me and get the free download today. Carl Gruber's free ebook, The Three Pillars, will positively change your life. All right, welcome to episode number 54 of this podcast, World Awakenings, the fast track to enlightenment. I'm your host, Carl Gruber, and just a quick note, please take a moment to click the subscribe button below to this channel so that you never miss a single episode of this show. The show where the main question is, why now, more than ever, are the people of the world awakening to all things spiritual, metaphysical, and enlightening? So let's uh, check in on our featured guest today. In today's show, we head across the Atlantic Ocean to England, not hard to do on the internet, uh, to visit with our featured guest, Jeremiah Scott. Over the last few years, he has developed an approach to meditation, spiritualism, and non-physical philosophy that blends his own understandings with uh, the teachings of Amazonian shamans and European spiritualists. That's a great combo there. Jeremiah also has written a book called The Theory of You, A Guide to Awakening Personal Spiritual Enlightenment, which details some of his own spiritual awakening journey. And by the way, he's also also a podcaster and now a member of the executive committee of the Institute of Spiritualist Mediums in the UK. Whoa, Jeremiah, that's a lot. Welcome, man. Welcome to World Awakenings. Thank you. Hi, Carl. Thanks for having, a, uh, having us on your show. Yeah, this, this is awesome. Jeremiah is located here in uh, the London, uh, England area? Yeah, the southeast, just uh, in, in a place called Essex. So we're about 40 minutes drive away from London. Uh, we're sort of in between London and Cambridge, equal distance from both at the moment. OK, well, I, I hope it's a little bit warmer than it is here in the, in the exciting Columbus, Ohio, in the U.S. Yeah. But, you know, so. Wow, Jeremiah. I mean, it sounds like you've been on an amazing journey of a, a personal spiritual awakening over the last few years of your life. And I, I've been reading your book and, and wow, you endured quite a bit of physical violence and abuse as a very young children, child. Was, was that a big factor in your eventual spiritual awakening? Uh, I wouldn't say uh, initially it, it was, but I think that, uh, I mean, it's quite a complex topic really uh, i think that from a spiritual perspective from a personal spiritual perspective i would say that i had set the intent of what i wanted this life to 
uh, to be and revolve around. Um, and I think that we like to use the old analogy that if you was going to uh, skip town uh, and you had a car on finance and you had a mortgage outstanding and you had various loans and credit cards, uh, and if you went around publicly telling everyone what you was about to do, then the bank manager and your other creditors are going to come knocking. Uh, and so I think that when we set this intent uh, uh, before we enter into this lifetime, uh, I think that if we are going to try and dedicate ourselves to a bit of a spiritual existence, uh, we might be tested very early on uh, in our life because that's really, I, I kind of think before the age of about seven years old, uh, the circumstances that you're thrown into, uh, you don't really have any say over that uh, sort of consciously from this physical aspect of living here in this time on this planet. Uh, I think that after that age, you do start to be able to exert some of your own intent and free will on what happens around you. Even from a very, very small child, you're able to influence certain things in your life. You're able to make some decisions. But in those early phases of your life, uh, yeah, you're kind of at the whim of, of what's going on around you. So it didn't really affect me going through it. I think that when I, I got older and I started realising that other people who had had similar experiences had reacted differently, that sort of started making me question things a little bit. I was like, well, I've processed it how I have, you're processing it in how you are. Uh, and then ultimately we see some people lose their battle with those types of struggles of integrating that energy from their early life. Uh, and so I think that, yeah, if we can share some of of that uh idea of how you can perhaps kind of accept and and move past what happened i think that that's a message that's sort of needed in the world at the moment i think it's beautiful that you were able to move past that uh that abuse and 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 evolve into uh you know a beautiful spiritual seeker and student um but as we know you know i'm i'm a a law of attraction life coach. I deal with many clients uh, also. Uh, so many people in the world don't move past that. You know, many people who were abused physically and mentally uh, and verbally as youngsters, they go on to perpetuate that and perpetuate it generation after generation. I think I even read that in your book. If you tried to pinpoint, you know, the source, if you went back to the people that abused you and then you realize, well, it came from their parents and then it came from their parents or other people. Yeah. I was shown the origin of, of it uh, in, an, in an ayahuasca ceremony um, in around, I think, around 2017. Uh, and I was shown that it's nobody's fault. OK, this this uh, abuse that passes down the generations. I was like, where does it come from? And what I was shown very clearly was that the circumstances uh, in society and in our world changed so drastically over the generations that there was a point in history uh, among our ancestors many, many generations ago where life was brutal, it was extremely hard. Uh, and so the primary focus for those prior generations was just to focus on getting through surviving from one day to the next and so you had to be strong you had to be extremely hardy and extremely strong there was no uh, time for some of the pursuits that we enjoy today uh, and so there was a, a a generation in everyone's family where someone made the decision that instead of uh, focusing on love and kindness and compassion we're going to focus on strength we're going to focus on resilience and a lot of ways uh, people naturally think to instill that upon children is through harsh lessons uh, and they kind of take this idea that it's better to it's tough love you know it's better to sort of show them young um, and it kind of gets more complicated as it passes down, down the generations because some people then dilute that message or corrupt it and start putting their emotions uh, their frustrations in with that uh, yeah I mean it's 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 sort of I think some of the features of it are similar among many many cases of abuse but the exact recipe for why each person suffered it and what they suffered it sort of varies from person to person but for me I think that yeah, we have to look back and, and there is no point in blaming anyone. Uh, I don't think that anyone who dishes out that type of punishment or abuse or, or suffering, uh, they're not doing it from a place of happiness. They've got some deep suffering going on in their lives as well. They've kind of lost that battle, haven't they? 
because they're projecting that on to people outside of them. So we have to have a bit of compassion for them as well. Well, you know, the, the entire history of mankind uh, has been a vicious cycle, uh, um, you know, century after century after century, millennium after millennium of lack, attack, judgment, ego-driven paradigms. And just like you said, this is only going to happen through tough love and, you know, and, and this type of thing. And I think now here in 2022 in, in our world, especially with, with the huge uh, uh, things going on, the chaotic, crazy things in the world, I think this is why a show like this came together to ask this question, why now more than ever are the people of the world awakening to all things spiritual, enlightening, and metaphysical? And I think we've finally gotten to the point, many of us, millions, millions of us are saying, there's got to be something better. What, there's something. What's your take on that? Okay, so I think that we, if you look back through history, if you study uh, many of the uh, ancient cultures, you will understand that spirituality or some form of spirituality, perhaps you want to call it religion or uh, maybe pagan beliefs, whatever. But there's always been this idea that man is something more than this physical being. What's happened, I think, since the Industrial Revolution is that we've gone well, well slightly before the Industrial Revolution. I think we can see a few hundred years back the church and science separated so originally priests would mix the uh, the kind of scientific approach to medicine alongside uh, this religious philosophy uh, and then eventually the church decided that some of it was unholy so science and and uh, the church went their separate ways i think that that was issue number one uh, because we would have on one side of the argument science or science believers uh, arguing that religion is non-existence because we can't uh, we can't prove it uh, but then we have to understand that science works only with what is observable and understandable. So science likes to conduct experiments. It likes to make observations. It likes to try to dissect things down to their core most components, design experiments, and then try to repeat the experiments over and over with the same outcomes. That's fine. It's very, very useful. Science has delivered us lots of uh, massive advances in technology in medicine. We live longer, more comfortable lives because of science. But if we look at the state of the universe, uh, it's around 68% of this universe is non-physical. It's unobservable. We don't know what it is. Uh, and then if we boil down it even further within the 32 uh, or a percent that is observable, we begin to see that science is working with this tiny little narrow bandwidth of what's observable and, and and what's uh, sort of measurable. So science has limited itself with the own way, its own ways, its own methods of, uh, of how it tries to analyze the world. The issue with uh, religion, for example, is a lot of it's done on conjecture. Uh, so it's like there isn't any particular proof, but I, I think what we need to understand is at some point, point there will have to be uh, a bit of a reunification between uh, maybe spiritual ideas and scientific ideas I think we're beginning to see the early signs of that with psychedelic use uh, I've been invited to participate in a study with John Hopkins University about the spiritual aspects of psilocybin uh, because all of the scientific study to date has revolved around this idea of what is uh, the physical effects of, of uh, psychedelics, like how does it change the chemistry of our brain? How does it change the physiology of our body? So we're seeing the early signs there. But I think another point uh, worth raising is this fact that we have industrialized our world uh, so dramatically since the end of the Victorian era that everything has become about progress, technical, technological progress, uh, and it's marching on and on and on and on. But it, we, we see everything has to be in cycles. And so I think what we're seeing now, uh, I think it was Carl Sagan, he spoke about this and, and he's, he talked about once uh, we had exhausted this cycle of capitalism, we would find our way back towards uh, mysticism and spirituality. Now, he saw that as a negative thing. 
but I see this as a positive thing. He saw that he he was a, a, a great believer in science and technology, and he thought that we were living uh, at this peak of our you know of our of our world of our culture when we had all of these industrial processes and we had all this hope and optimism uh, for living better, longer, more comfortable lives using those scientific principles. But for me, uh, I think that it's inevitable. We've discovered a new tool, which is industry, technology, um, and we've been fixated with it for the last hundred years or so. But there's only a, a certain scope of limit to what we can get there. Uh, and now we're starting to see there are rising levels of uh, negative mental health, increasing rates of suicide among Western society. So even though we're supposed to have it all, we don't have it all. A lot of people can't stand where they are. So now there is this there is this search. We're beginning to see the seeds. And this is what the, the mass awakening reckon, uh, represents to me, which is people that are moving away from this idea that we just need to focus on what can be seen in front of us. Well, you know, you, you touched on a couple of interesting topics that, that I did want to bring up. Your, your bio uh, on your website uh, indicates that you teach something called non-physical philosophy. And then also your interest in, in plant medicine uh, that, uh, you know, the shamans in South America and Siberia and around the world teach. Um, Go into that because, you know, I mean, non-physical, what exactly is non-physical philosophy? Well, I, I would work with, uh, I mean, it's a, probably a nice word to talk about ideas that come from, uh, from spiritual sources. So I, I realized early on uh, that a lot of the ideas that I would have be given, I would have access to uh, when I would, what was natural to me, I eventually come to this understanding that it's not spoken about. I can't, there's certain things things I'm shown I have been fortunate enough to see through various states of altered consciousness so when I talk about non-physical well it's the consciousness that is non-physical we can't dissect the body and find consciousness so for me uh, ideas philosophical ideas or ideas that can perhaps advance our understandings of ourselves uh, of of the of how we occupy this space I regard those as non-physical philosophy because if you look at some of the classical philosophers, the Greeks, for example, they were trying to look at uh, how the world operated. They were trying to, they were the early sort of scientific approaches. They talked about the, the four elements, didn't they? The wind, the earth, the fire. Uh, so they were, their, their approach to philosophy would be to try and sort of, uh, analyze what was in front of them but for me I refer back to these ideas that are given to me from uh, external energy non-physical energy and so I find that if you work uh, in certain states of meditation, uh, if you work with different plants, uh, so uh, and magic mushrooms as well, uh, you can access different realms and I've found in, in my travels that different energies different spiritual energies are associated with those different places uh, so you see a lot of competitiveness uh, among spiritual people uh, so if somebody's had a really uh, mind-altering amazing meditative experience they seem to want to a lot of people will go well meditation is the only way uh, if you use psychedelics you're taking a shortcut uh, but for me I, i've had this desire to try to learn uh, as much as possible uh, and so what i've found through working with all these various different groups of people uh, over the last 10 years that there is more than one source of wisdom and energy and knowledge available uh, and i'm just like wanting to know what it all is uh, and so i wouldn't see any any sort of system as better or worse than the other but they all have their own specific wisdom associated with them and as uh, my my job here is to try and collate as much of that as possible uh, and and pass it on to people who might want to to listen or read or hear about it so, so you've done your own personal research with a, a number of uh, visits to the Amazon and doing some of the plant medicine ceremonies with, uh, with the shamans. Uh, one of my past guests on the show here, Isabel Stahl from uh, Norway, has been down in Costa Rica studying uh, uh, with the shamans, and, and she's still down there, and she's been doing the ayahuasca ceremonies. I mean, how does plant ceremonies, whether it's the mushrooms or the ayahuasca or, or whatever, 
How does it help facilitate uh, connecting with the unseen realm and, and, a, and a spiritual connection? Okay, so what we have to, uh, first and foremost, I'll give a little disclaimer. Uh, my experience of psychedelics is totally different to what you'll find elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of people I've found will uh, have deeply personal healing experiences. So what the, I always say that the psychedelics will give you what you need in that moment. But because I've spent a lot of time working on myself and with myself and uh, I live a, a, a very uh, strict and disciplined lifestyle, when I work with um, psychedelics, the personal that they're, they're, they're not the the experiences aren't personal healing experiences so uh, i've been told what i have uh, i'll have a shamanic experience of the plants and so what that means is i'll be given knowledge that is um, more than just personal it, it's something that i can pass on to others and so how um it's i i kind of find that working and explaining this way it's like trying to describe the indescribable uh, and and so we perceive with our main sense organs so we've got sight uh, hearing we we smell and, and we can touch uh, and so this is like what we use to navigate this space this this physical space here but when we're released from from uh, our, our physical bodies we're able to perceive uh, in sort of frequencies and bandwidths that we just don't really have the vocabulary to describe here mm -hmm. so it's like it's not that there is a uh, an energy version of me walking through these realms my consciousness expands i leave behind the body uh, and then i'm able to access different spaces using a completely different set of sense organs so a lot of it's very uh, very conceptual um i find that when i work with psychedelics what will happen is that the spirits are aware they always greet me um with thanks and kindness they they say thank you for coming uh, and then they will begin to work with me and so what i've likened this to is that if you watch an artist uh take a canvas they'll take some chalk and they'll sort of uh, roughly sketch the the shapes the features of, uh, of if they're doing a portrait you know they'll do an oval for the face they'll draw the lines and they'll they'll put the basics on the canvas first of all and then after that over a period of days or, or weeks or however long they'll fill it in and they'll refine it all and so what happens when I work with psychedelics is I will be given the framework the the uh, original like outlines of the knowledge on the canvas and then throughout maybe two weeks three weeks a month however long it takes however complex the information is uh, when I'm going about my day-to-day -day life when I'm entering in states of meditation um, I will then be given the rest of the information so it's like the hardest to uh, reach the hardest to access pieces of of the puzzle will be shown to me in in those outward states of consciousness when you're under the uh the influence or working with the psychedelics but the the information the knowledge will develop over the course of time afterwards uh so yeah it's 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 a tool to me wow interesting you know i'm curious about a little while ago you stated that 68 percent of all that is, is in the unseen realm and 32% is in the world of form. Now, if you look at um, what quantum physicists are showing and studies from like Lynn McTaggart's uh, study of the field, the unseen realm of, uh, of, the, of connectivity throughout all of uh, all that is and Greg Braden's divine matrix, um, and also the spiritual uh, uh, teachings like A Course in Miracles, I'm a big student on that, would have you understand that everything in reality is in the unseen realm and anything in form is an illusion. How did you come up with those percentages? And I, I'm just curious on that. Uh, well, we, we just look at science itself. We talk about the, uh, how the universe is constructed. So they talk about dark energy dark matter this is stuff that they know is there but they cannot they can't detect it they don't know what it is they don't know how to analyze it so if you look at the quantities of of like physical uh, matter atomic matter uh, and then we begin to look so you talk about the quantum realms there yeah, this is a part of it we're beginning to understand a little more of what's going on there um 
I think that we will have a lot of spiritual re uh, revelations from the work with con uh, quantum mechanics. I think that it will lead uh, scientists to some very uncomfortable realizations that this universe does not function without consciousness. Uh, Consciousness is not a product of the universe. It is a requirement for the universe. Uh, I think that when they begin to have these understandings, there'll be a, a yeah, there'll be a bit of tension developing amongst the community. Uh, it will make them question everything that they've come to rely on. Uh, so the quantum world, yeah, I, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of interest in knowledge will seep through, um, but yeah, when I use those figures that I use, I just like to use science's own observations against it really because when we're working with people who might uh, be su quite stubborn uh, and don't really want to subscribe or or, or believe to uh, you know this this way of looking at the universe um, and they will always take a scientific approach to trying to argue with you yeah. so for me I thought it was worth spending a little bit of time just understanding uh, what science actually is and and what it is that they are are sort of representing uh, and so this these numbers that i speak of this is to do with the the makeup of the universe uh, and and how the the vast majority of this universe is classed as either dark energy or dark matter uh, and that is just a nice way for us saying we don't know what it is we can't observe it we can't measure it we feel that it's there but we have no way of actually proving it's there yeah. And, you know, I'm not that not that I'm an expert on this, but, you know, the, the more I study about this, that uh, uh, modern uh, worldly uh, science is based on mainly on Newtonian physics and science. And yet, you know, quantum physics is showing that Newtonian uh, science is wrong. You know, there's well, there's this cause and then everything else is a, a, an effect, you know, and really quantum physics looks at the cause of all. Like I said, I'm not an expert. I, I may be barking up the wrong tree here. I, I think what the, the uh, I mean, what was it Einstein? He had the, his standard theory of relativity, didn't he? And that was to dis, uh, describe classic uh, physics mm -hmm. so like how light will uh, you know be transmitted from the sun and enter into earth's atmosphere like all of the things that we can see the uh, the interactions to do with atomic uh, atomic like particles so actual physical material that sort of standard theory applies to that now the quantum realm uh, goes it's almost it's like subatomic isn't it it's it's the hidden uh, stuff that's below that that sort of physical material that we can all sort of grab and hold on to uh, and so i think that what they're beginning to kind of have this idea is that there has to be some work to develop a standard theory for quant for quantum physics because a lot of what applies in the physical world doesn't apply to the sub uh, sub atomic world and so there needs to be um a bridge almost so what applies to one doesn't apply to the other but they both real they both exist uh, but it's how do we how do we unite one how do we bring one to the other uh, and so yeah that's for brighter minds than mine oh, man i hope that happens so you know yeah. i'm, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit uh, i see also that you are a medium and so what does a medium do and how does that differ from being a, a true tra trans channel of a non-physical being uh well i i mean this is yeah I, I i will use that word uh it's an interesting word because in in western society it's got quite a, a negative connotation hasn't it uh i think that the issue with spiritualism and mediumship is that uh unfortunately it comes from uh, a, a time so was it the the fox sisters uh who founded this whole idea of spiritualism well they they kind of admitted themselves that they were being fraudulent uh, and so this was this was tough because uh, how do you how do you gain credibility back um, there was a, a, a massive societal uh, interest in mediumship and spiritualism uh, at the start of the uh, 1900s uh, and uh, the spiritualist churches were formed. Uh, and I do think that, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting way to work. But I always say to people like, what you call me, what label you want to attribute to me really depends on where I am in the world. 
if you put me in the Amazon, you would call me a shaman. If you put me in Asia, you would call me a yogi or a mystic. Uh, in Europe, in the West, you would call, refer to me as a medium. Now, these are all things that I have interest in. These are all things that I understand how to work in. Um, but for me, I don't personally uh, go, well, that is exclusively what I am. Now, mediumship is uh, the attempt to work with energy uh, of our loved ones, uh, people that have sort of departed. Now I've been shown, I'm very fortunate to have crossed paths with a, uh, a career medium when I was uh, a, a younger man. I've only ever, and this is the thing, what I love about this world, this work. Um, I wasn't necessarily a believer of all of that type of, uh, of, of activity when I was young. I didn't used to watch programs like it on TV. I wouldn't go to events, uh, but then as fate has often played a hand in my life uh, I crossed paths with a lady and had I've only ever had uh, readings from this one lady uh, and it turned out she was one of the most decorated and highly respected mediums in Europe uh, and she is the vice president of the Institute of Spiritualist Mediums that's an organization that was founded in 1956 and it's all uh, surrounding like ethical mediumship so responsible mediumship because there are a lot of people who would just like to go out and try to use it as a tool to make money uh, so a lot of my work is charity based uh, I don't profit from uh, spiritual work and quite often a lot of time I will give away more money than I generate in a month uh, and so this can have its own obstacles at certain times within my life uh, but I think that it is not for me it's not necessarily about the money and so I think when we talk about mediumship there is this uh, there's a there is a bit of a renewed interest in it uh, and it's certainly something that I I've uh, met the criteria to be awarded uh, the status of a recommended approved medium by the Institute of Spiritualist Mediums. There's only about 25 of us in the world at the moment. Uh, and so it's not it's not a title that is given out freely. Um, and you have to go through a multi year approval pro uh, process to to acquire that title. Uh, you have to be. Um, uh, assessed by your peers three times uh, you have to give uh, you have to provide references from public work speaking work uh, spiritualist church work uh, and this is all done voluntary as well so this is all like done uh, me working for free for years and years and years to uh, to acquire this title um, I think that mediumship is certainly something that is possible and uh you could it can be really helpful it can change certain people's lives having those messages delivered uh, ethically responsibly uh, and so yeah for me it is it's it's a small part of what it is that i'm able to do uh, and i've had a lot of success with it over the years um yeah i i am a believer of it but i would say for me mediumship is about contacting and working with a, a, a certain bandwidth of spirits mm -hmm. so spirits that have recently uh, had carnations in this lifetime uh, uh human like spirits so there are some mediums that will work with animals um some people try to work with uh, with our guides uh, but for me this is just a, a drop in the ocean of what's possible there are so many different types of energies uh, that we have access to and i just i think that um, mediumship or calling yourself a medium i think it's self-restrictive uh, to a certain degree because it it closes the doors to a, a, a lot of other energies that are available within this within this universe I think what, what the things that you do, you're the spectrum of the things that, that your abilities are, are really beautiful. And one thing, uh, again, in reading your book, The Theory of You, uh, I see that you're quite the purveyor of, of mindfulness. And, and so what exactly is mindfulness? I know anxiety can be a result of trauma and ego-directed thinking. And how can uh, mindfulness uh, be used to, to help uh, somebody you know, in a practical manner? OK, so I think that what we need to understand, I think it was Confucius who talked about uh, anxiety being a fear of something that's uh, coming to pass. So I, uh, anxiety is rooted in the future. 
uh, depression is rooted in the past. Uh, and so we have this, this moment available in, in the centre, don't we, the present. Uh, and so mindfulness is trying to kind of ground ourselves here. But it's deeper than that because obviously we, you know, we need to plan for uh, some aspect of the future. We need to know when we've got to go and buy uh, our groceries. We need to make sure that we are going to have like heat uh, and, and, and clothing. So we have to have a little bit of an eye on the future. Now, for me, I think a lot of mindfulness practice is all about uh, breathing into the moment, being present in here and now, trying to forget about the future, trying to forget about the past. Um, but I come to realise that we kind of create the past, the future and the present. It's all happening simultaneously. So the end of this chat is in the future. The beginning of this chat was in the past, but we're here right now. It all flows from one thing to the other. Uh, and so I kind of worked uh, to what like begin to understand the routines in my life that will deliver me uh, what it is that I hope for. So I'll have a certain diet. I will make sure that I spend time uh, in the mountains or time walking, but I have to spend make, make sure I have time outdoors. I will dedicate time to my physical health. I'll dedicate time to uh, working within inside the mind. Uh, and I understand that as long as I do this, it's like a tap. A leaky tap will always fill the bucket. And so all I need to do for mindfulness is create a routine of small, relatively easy uh, like sequences that make me where I want to be, how I want to be physically, mentally, and then just kind of repeat it. Now, this doesn't mean that I live the same day in and out. But I allow myself uh, to enjoy this world, enjoy this life uh, and really observe everything around me. So uh, a lot of people who spend time with me uh, will always talk about how I'm like here and how I will pay attention. Like if I'm talking to someone, I'm focused on what they have to say. I'm not on my phone. I'm not thinking about where I've got to be later on. I, I feel like I'm always just settling into the moment. If you take me somewhere new that I haven't been in the world, it doesn't matter what that place is. I'll always take a moment. If I see something uh, that looks nice, I'll, I'll pause and I'll, I'll take in my surroundings. I'll take in my physical environment. So I find that a lot of people are always trying to rush through this world. They're always trying to get to that next place. But we're never there. We're always here. So for me, I, I just thought, well, how do I become more comfortable in in this vehicle of movement i'm moving through or i have this idea of moving through my life uh so how do i make myself comfortable because i find that people are uh, deeply impatient they're deeply uncomfortable with themselves with the routines with the sequences around them uh, and so i just kind of begin to work on what it was that that made me uh sort of comfortable in in that moment um i started to have like small re revelations this wasn't something that happened quickly this took me years to to find this place where i'm at now um i i started to realize that a lot of people are seeking some purpose some deep purpose some deep meaning towards their lives uh, and they get very anxious if they feel that the purpose isn't revealed to them uh, and then if they feel that they have identified a purpose they get equally anxious if they don't feel that they're fulfilling the purpose but I found through my own experience that some of the best moments in my life come from the opposing energy, from moments of non-purpose. So I had this epiphany. Uh, I've, I've got a little dog. We go for walks and there's an ancient woodland not too far from where I live. Uh, it's said to be about 13,000 years old. It emerged after the last ice age and it's remained untouched. And it's one of the only pieces of untouched uh, virgin woodland in this area of, of my country. Uh, and so it's just got this lovely feel about it. It's got this lovely energy, this lovely vibe. And it's quite a trek. You have to walk for about an hour uh, from the closest town to get there. So it's not always busy. Uh, and so I would take my my little dog for a walk up there. And there's a certain part when you enter into the forest and it's got all these pine trees and, and they smell amazing. And they're all on, on the side of a hill and they just got this like amazing like, uh, 
sort of structure to them. And I went there in the autumn and as I was walking through, the wind was blowing and it was just this amazing sound. It sounded almost like a uh, like a rain stick, you, you know, with all the rice. And, and I was just like, this sound is amazing. And I started looking forward to going and, and if it was a windy day, I was like, oh, it's going to be brilliant when I get to the, to the forest. But then I had this this realization. I sort of stood there one autumn day, and I was like, "These trees did not evolve to make a noise when the wind blows through their branches. That is that is complete fluke of their evolution. Trees don't understand that their branches will sway and and make this amazing noise. And so I realized that my favorite part of that walk, my favorite part of this forest." had no purpose there was no purpose for it to come into existence it was a fluke uh, and then I started realizing that some of my most amazing moments so when I walk uh, I like to do long distance treks so I've walked uh, a number of times from one side of the UK to the other I like to walk through the highlands in Scotland uh, and I walk through the mountains in between Inverness and Fort William and what I realized is when I'm walking like in the in the hills and the mountains alongside Loch Ness and it's the most stunningly beautiful uh, terrain that you could possibly imagine. But there is no purpose for it looking that beautiful. Mm. It, is, it is a complete byproduct of the way that the mountains formed after the glaciers retreated. And so then I begin to see that my most favorite things in life happened by accident. There was no purpose for these things to come into existence. And then I realized that when I get to enjoy that feeling, when I'm in those moments of non-purpose, very interestingly, purpose starts to be shown to me. I start to get indications of where I should be heading and what I should be doing next. Uh, and so I like to teach people that mindfulness is about switching off. It's about beginning to listen to things that you never thought to even look at or hear or see. Wow, you're you're like Eckhart Tolle's brother. This is awesome. <laughs> your your ability to be powerful in the present moment is beautiful. I do want to do of ask you this question too, because I I have noticed this, and sometimes in my my own experience, that there can be a confusion between mindfulness and meditation. What is the difference? Well, very interestingly, um, there are various different states of meditation. So if you want to enter into uh, a meditation where you, you, you're going to close your eyes and you're going to sit in the lotus position, for example, that is a certain type of meditation. Now, I have found uh, that there are certain places, there are certain states, like if I walk for 20 or 30 miles in a day, which I've done quite frequently, um, I will find that after a while, I will wear the body down uh, to the point where it stops giving me these these feedbacks and I enter into what I would call a waking meditation. So I'm fully conscious, but my mind enters into this meditative state. So I always say the body needs movement and the mind needs stillness. Uh, and the societies that we've created for ourselves now, we encourage an overactive mind and an underactive body. Uh, and so our current way of living in the West uh, is against odds with the ways that our bodies evolved. Uh, and so what happens is you will have aches and pains that come as a consequence of having uh, lifestyles that are too lethargic. And you will have, uh, you talk about anxieties and depressions and to some degree, so not, all, not, not the whole picture, but we have to actually put on the table the truth that your anxiety and your depression can quite possibly be from an overactive mind to some degree okay everything that you fear uh, you could be valid in in your beliefs everything that you're depressed about you could be completely valid in your beliefs but if you allow the mind to just sit there and spin and spin and spin and spin and spin it's all going to feel a lot more painful than it needs to be and so for me i find that um yeah we mindfulness might you you might associate it with meditation but i associate it with a very specific form of meditation uh, and that that state that it takes some doing to get into it uh, but once you're there you can have some incredible realization so i will have a lot of uh, understandings like be given to me whilst i'm out in the wilderness but 
this takes a while to slip into that state because you have to wear the body down. You have to give the body all the movement it can handle. Uh, and then the, the, if you're in a suitably beautiful, pristine place, the mind can begin to relax and not focus on the past or worry about the future. You can begin to just enjoy what's in front of you. And when you do that for long enough, then you just switch you just go into this waking meditation and then spiritual energies external energies they can just sort of slip in and start to give you what it is that you need to hear in that moment i really love how you pointed out that our body and mind need physical movement and yet combine with meditative uh, um, um, contemplations because i've been a runner for 40 years and and i've run runners of- high <laughs> right and that's I'm- what it- that's what it is. Well, it yeah. is. Well, but well, you know, I, I, we can talk about runners high, but but you know, for me, um, I run five six days a week still, and for me, yeah. my meditative time is running, and my mm-hmm. mind quiets, and and I become I'm grateful. I repeat affirmations, and sometimes I just don't think anything. And later on, when I come home, I'm more even keeled everything and so it is my form of meditation although i do regular meditation too we would call that karmic yoga uh so there are a number of different types of yoga uh and the the yoga that's been imported to the west uh is just understood as these physical uh, like um, exercise in movements but for me yoga is about preparing the body for meditation uh, and so that that message has sort of been lost uh, as as we focus on it in the West. But there's a very specific form of yoga uh, in India that they, they refer to as karmic yoga. And that is your action. So uh, we've also diluted the meaning of karma. We believe karma in the West to be some sort of uh, law and order, some sort of universal credit system you you you, you know you're going to get your karma you're going to get your good karma you're going to get your bad karma but karma is uh, if you take it back to its original meaning it simply means your action and so karmic yoga is uh, your action uh, and so it's repeated over and over and over so you could have a cleaner who's sweeping from side to side to side and if they're doing that every day over uh, a period of years the body will learn to sort of switch off giving you that feedback and the mind will begin to quiet quiet so you say you've been running for 40 years is that right Mm -hmm. 40 years that's a long time to be uh, engaging in that same activity so that is your action your karma and your karma your yoga which is uh, translates originally to the set like your line so bringing you into line with yourself so your action brings you into the line with yourself so that is your karmic yoga and so you repeat it over and over and over and you just say you get karma you you repeat affirmations to yourself i, I should imagine you've developed some pretty uh, profound wisdom over the years in in those moments either during or immediately after so when you are calm uh, once you have had that experience then you're settled and you probably get in some connection with external spiritual energy and then they're able to work with you as well That is awesome. Yeah, I'm going to remind people, gosh, this has been a beautiful conversation. I want to remind people we are speaking with Jeremy Scott, uh, Jeremiah Scott uh, from uh, the UK, and he is a spiritual teacher and author, uh, uh, on and on, and and medium. And, and, you know, so we we do have to wind down here in a couple minutes. I, I bought your book recently, The Theory of You. Can you tell us more about it? And I think you have a a second edition out too. Tell us a little bit about it before we head out of here. Yeah, uh, so I I wanted to, well, I was instructed to write uh, a a bit of a rough guide for uh, some basic ideas that we can use to uh, overcome some of our common obstacles that we face in in the West. So I feel that we live in a time where uh, if we look back to spiritual ideas from the past, if you look back to, say, Buddhism, if you look back to Eastern philosophy, if you look back to uh, ancient Western philosophy, what's happened is that we've accelerated so fast as a culture, as a species, beyond 
those conditions that we used to live under so we would be in a, a maybe a, a tribal or like a, a small village a small town based society for millennia uh, and then all of a sudden in in my lifetime we've gone from having more than half of the world's population living rurally to more than half of the world's population living in big urbanized uh, like city centers and so what this means is that we need a, a, a way of looking at ourselves uh, spiritually that is fit for today. Uh, and so I have a number of books planned, uh, but we need we need to bring this information into the world over a course of, of a number of years. And so the the first book that I've, I've penned there is some uh, ideas to gently introduce anybody to the idea of how a spiritual uh, lifestyle could be accessible and usable to help them um, maybe overcome some of their struggles. Now, I just offer people the canvas. For, it's them that has to understand it and integrate it and use it differently. So this isn't a clear set of instructions. If you live like this, this will happen. This is a lot of uh, ideas that you can take bits and pieces from for, for that moment. And so what I found is that when people read the book, they'll go back a few months later, read it again and take something totally different from it. Mm -hmm. So it's I always find that it's for you now, not you in the future, not you in the past. But the ideas and the interpretations of that knowledge will change as you change. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that we have this idea where somebody uh, who might have had a profound spiritual realization then writes that exact thing down and then begins to sort of uh, preach this as gospel. It worked for me, so it must work for you. It must work for everyone. Follow my system. Follow my seven steps to becoming enlightened. But that's not not the case for me. I think that we're all here to have an individual experience. We're all here to try and find we're an experiment to try and find our unique way of living that is fit for us uh, but we're in this confused state of, of society where we believe that we need to have uh, our ideas adopted by uh, our followers our subscribers our supporters we need likes we need external validation continuously but i'd like to remind people that your life is for you to live uh, and so this book is a little bit of a reminder of that. It gives explanations on how you can integrate certain uh, traumas that you might have been unfortunate enough to experience. Uh, and then once you've done it, then really I just try to empower people to ask that question. What do they want from life? How are they going to go forwards and make the life that they want? Not the life that I've led, not the life that anyone else has, uh, has led, but them. Yeah, I, I uh, like I said, I, I purchased your book the other day. Uh, it's available on Amazon. I got the ebook. You can buy the paperback. Uh, it's also available on your website. But what I like about uh, the theory of you, what I have seen read so far is you have a very nice objective eye observing the, the, the idiosyncrasies of life, but the way you write is not complex. It's, it's, it's very understandable and readable. And, and I think, I think that's probably why so many people are attracted to it. And um, yeah, how can people connect with you? What, what's your website? I'm sure people would love to connect with you and work with you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I'm on uh, jsmedium.co.uk for anybody who'd want to look at me there. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. All those, all those places that we all have to be now. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's it's an evolving uh, thing, isn't it? So, you know, uh, there's a suggestion at the moment that I need to go into TikTok. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like, OK, uh, you just have to sort of listen to where people are. Um, yeah. So it, I don't know uh, how long this podcast is going to be accessible for, but you might be listening to this in years and be like Facebook. Who talks about that anymore? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. Well, this has yeah. been awesome. Thank you so much, Jeremiah, for being on World Awakenings. What a beautiful discussion. Uh, I will uh, make sure I put the link to your website uh, with with the show uh, so people can link up with you. And uh, so uh, tonight when I when I get back later on, I got to keep reading your book because it is awesome. So thank you so much, my friend. Namaste for being on the, on the show. Thank you. Okay, have a great day. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. This has been another episode of World Awakenings. The Fast Track to Enlightenment with your host, Carl Gruber, a certified Law of Attraction Life Coach. 
We welcome you to tune in each and every episode of this podcast, World Awakenings, as we open your mind, your heart, and your eyes to the fact that all the world's population is now, more than ever, awakening to the truth of all things metaphysical and spiritual, and just how they play an all-important role in our moment-to-moment everyday life. Much love and light to you, my friend. Thank you for tuning in.